wonderful. It's a three-hour drive up here each way for her to come up and spend time with her brother, so I think that's pretty phenomenal. And then your drive was a little bit longer. Did you fly in? You flew in? Okay, so how long was that? An hour and a half? Oh, you flew from Dallas. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow. But she came from Oklahoma, the city of the red dirt, or the state of the red dirt. And so uh, we're glad to have uh, Amber with us as well today and everybody else. Okay. <clears throat> this is Father's Day. And we again, just say happy Father's Day to all of you that are fathers. And the would-be fathers, we give you, uh, we applaud you in advance. All right. Now, we know the Ten Commandments. We've read them many times. We've seen them posted on the billboards. And um, the Fifth Commandment, does anybody remember what that one is? Honor and father and mother, yes. And it says that your days may be long and that you may be blessed in the land, which he is sending us to, uh, to live in. Now, that's in Exodus 20, verse 12, and that's... Uh, and then it's, we also see that in Ephesians 6, 2, where Paul is writing, and he said that that command was the first commandment with promise, and that is to honor your father and mother that it may go well with you in the land. You know, if things, and I've said this many times, if things aren't going well with you in your life, stop and think about it for a minute. Are you honoring your mom and your dad? And if you're not, then maybe you need to back up, maybe you need to reconsider uh, what's going on in your life with your relationship with them. Because the Bible teaches that honor actually means to value. And when you value something, uh, I've seen people get like a car or a piece of furniture or whatever, and the kids didn't value it, so they trashed it, right? So if you value something, you're going to take care of it, and you're going to treat uh, it or them very well. So I just want you to stop and think. Take today few moments today and think about your relationship with your parents. Do you honor them? Are you doing the best to show them respect? And even, it doesn't say honor the good parents. It says honor your mother and your father. It doesn't say, it doesn't qualify that, okay? Now we see in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, it talks about that in the last days, there's going to be all kinds of crazy things going on. And one of those signs of the last days is people, children are disobedient to parents. So we see from the very beginning, it was God's plan for children to be honoring to parents. And then we see in the last days, children are going to be disobedient to parents. So we see that there's been a little bit of a breakdown from the father's original plan unto the end of the age. It appears that the breakdown uh, has been an ongoing thing. And has anybody noticed it in their lifetime? It seems to be accelerating maybe a little bit. Um, and it seems like with each generation, it's just accelerating more and more of uh, falling, getting farther from the Father's original plan. Um, our culture reflects what's going on. I mean, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Television and movies and the media reflects what's going on in our nation. It also influences what goes on in our nation. So it's kind of a, a circle thing. So there's been some, some TV shows that used to be on TV. You all might remember some of these. Um, some of you probably aren't old enough to remember this one. Probably most of you are not. I don't remember it at all. But Fathers Knows Best. I, I remember hearing about that. Did you see that? Fathers Knows Best. Do you remember that, Anna? Maybe Mom and Dad just didn't show it to us because you you remember seeing that? Well, that was in, you're younger than me. So that had to have been Fathers Knows Best. Okay, so there you go. And then there was uh, Eight is Enough. Anybody remember that one? Yeah, that was way, you got to fast forward a good bit. Uh, then there was uh, Little House on the Prairie. Anybody remember that one? Does anybody, anybody remember the Waltons? Seeing that, that was a, that, I loved the Waltons. That was really, really good. Still is today. Does anybody remember the Cosbys? That was a lot of fun to watch the Cosbys. We enjoyed that one. Um, but if you look at, you know, all these different sitcoms and shows that used to be on TV, it was pretty much the same. There was the father, the mother, and the children at various ages growing up, experiencing different trials and difficulties in life, learning experiences. And even when they had <laughs> sitcoms like The Jeffersons or All in the Family with, with Archie Bunker, 
and those were, weren't what you would call stellar examples of the American family, they still had the father, the, the mother, and the children, right? And so everything was kind of intact there. So uh, and I, you, some of you may remember there was this show called Ozzy, this couple called Ozzy and Harriet. Yeah, well, then it went to Ozzy Osbourne and his family. Did anybody ever watch that on TV? Ozzy Osbourne, did you see that? That was some crazy stuff. And then, you know, then there was just variations of all kinds of det deterioration in the families. Uh, don't, don't raise your hand. I don't want you to admit this. Charlie Sheen and the Two and a Half Men. Anybody remember that show? That was, I, I did see some of it, you know, from time to time. It was like, I'd sit and think, what in the heck is everybody attracted to this? It was, it had, it was vulgar. It was, had sexual content all through it. It was, they, they had all kinds of, of crude humor. And you, you think, that from where it was from, you know, the father knows best to two and a half men, it's like, this is crazy, you know, what we see in our nation. And it's, it's just been going on even more so since then. And usually, even in today's time, the father is portrayed as a bumbling goof, a big goober who doesn't know his head from a hole in the ground or whatever. All right, um, U.S. families are under attack. Anybody agree with that? Yeah, they really are. Um, it's been said that if you can tear the family apart or destroy the family, then you can tear the nation apart or destroy the nation, and there's truth in that. As a bus driver, I have seen so many things, and I just did summer school just two weeks, and it was like 10, 12 new kids I'd never met before, and so uh, it's just amazing how many, there's, there's an abundance of absent fathers in homes, abundance of that, abundance of uh, fathers that are uh, on alcohol or drugs, abundance of fathers that are behind bars, and there's just no lack of that type of thing, and so there's uh, definitely there has been a breakdown, and you know, we're going to look at a couple, uh, uh, three three fathers in the Bible who didn't, probably didn't make the top 10 biblical fathers list. And then we're going to look at a couple that were definitely at, in, the, in that list, it's, at least as far as I'm concerned. Uh, <clears throat> and I've shared this just a few weeks ago with you all about, uh, in Genesis 18, uh, it's, it's talking about Abraham, and it said that, you know, God was talking about Abraham, and he said, surely he shall become a great and mighty nation. And he said, and I know him. He will command his household after him. And there is, it's, it's incredibly important from God's perspective anyway, from the way I read the word, that following him, you're going to set an example for those who will follow you. Amen. And I wrote a note that said, it appears to me that there's a connection between a godly son being a godly son to the father and being a godly father to our sons. And so it's, it's important that we pay attention, that we learn, that we grow. And I, I don't know, I, I used to think that I was a, a really good dad and all that. But, you know, since then I've seen so many areas that I could have improved. But you know what? I'm not going to condemn myself. I'm not going to beat myself up over that. I just learn in life and hope to grow from that. And... Uh, one thing about Abraham is that uh, it's said in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 7, that God, this, it records that Abraham was God's friend forever. Even though he blew it with Ishmael, he blew it with Hagar, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't perfect in every way, but he was God's friend. And God loved him and God honored him. And I am really looking forward to the day when we are all gathered together in heaven, all these saints from eons past and eons future, we all get together and they're, they're, we get to see everybody's lives in detail, you know, to whatever the Father would let us see. And, you know, to see, rewind Abraham's life and see him walking along with Ishmael and walking along with uh, Isaac. And he's teaching them about the eternal one. And he's, you know, just living life, and they're, they're shepherding the goats or the sheep or whatever. And then he, he's talking, he looks up to the distance, and he sees these great, mighty, beautiful hills, majestic hills. And he says, you take a look at that, sons. And, and he starts telling them that this was breathed into existence by the Holy One, the, the one, the, uh, the great I Am. And he, I would want to see those little details. 
those little snippets of when he was speaking to them and imparting to them uh, truth in life. And, you know, um, it's not that we sit down with our kids and say, okay, kids, sit down. Well, I'm going to talk to you about God. It's not necessarily like that. It's just as we live life, as we go through life, and they observe us and they, they watch us, and, and you just give them, just teach them a little bit here and a little bit there, and they watch you and they observe you. And we, <laughs> I don't remember, Bridges brought this up several times, but there was a gentleman, he's got a kind of an unusual name, he was out there at Bethel, Sherry would probably remember, but he said, he noticed his son was about two years old, I guess, his son was about two years old, and his son would bend over to pick something up, he'd go, Ugh! And, and he thought, going on and so he paid attention to him and every time his son would bend over to pick something up he'd uh, and make that sound and he, he thought that's really odd so he just started thinking has he got some kind of a problem you know so he started paying attention to his son and and he was really kind of zoned in on that and he said then one day he just bent over to pick something up and he went uh, he did it himself he said he's mimicking me he saw me do it, and he thinks that's what you do when you bend over, you grunt. Ugh. So he started grunting. He just thought it was the right thing to do. So, you know, this thing of setting an example for our children, it's really important that, that we set examples that are worthy of following. Amen? <laughs> I remember we had this one gentleman that came and sang at our church. He was a phenomenal singer. And he said <laughs> he was uh, loved football. And he was watching the Dallas Cowboys and was playing somebody. And his grandson come up beside him and says, Papa, should you be watching that? He says, just football game. He said, look at the way them ladies are dressed. You know how they do close-ups? And I don't even watch football, but I've seen enough in my past where they zoom in and zoom out. And you, you see whatever, you know. And he said, he said no, that's okay. <laughs> it's just football. And he said, then later he realized, oh, man, he got me. So he told his grandson, he said, you're right, I shouldn't be watching that, so he quit. I think that's, that's a good example of a, of a father or grandfather right there, too. All right, three of them that didn't make the top ten list. All right, Eli, the high priest, we all know about him. He had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and it's, uh, you find about them in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2. And it said that God said to Eli, you honored your sons more than you honored me. In other words, you didn't want to offend them. You didn't want to get them mad at you, so you didn't say anything to them while they were sinning. You didn't rebuke them. You didn't try to restrain them. You just let them do whatever they wanted to do. And he said, you honored them more than you honored me. And so he, you know, you know, the Ichabod was written, and the glory has departed, and the sons died. Ich, Eli died. It was, a, it was a bad day for the Eli family. All right. Number two is Samuel. He was a judge and a prophet in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Samuel was a pretty cool guy, right? He was a phenomenal guy, actually very, very godly. But he didn't fare that well as a father. And it said that in verses 1 and 2, he made his sons judges in Israel, Joel and Abiah. In verse 3, uh, in four, 3 through 5, it said that uh, the elders, the leaders of the nation of Israel got together and they came to Samuel and they said, Hey, Sam, <laughs> you're getting up in years. And your sons, they are not like you. He said, they're not following your ways. And it says that in verse 3, that they, they pursued lucre, which is money obtained uh, inappropriately, through maybe criminal or uh, illegally, whatever. And it said, they take bribes and they have perverted justice. And they so much so didn't want Samuel's sons to lead them that they said, give us a king. And that's when they got Saul. And things went that spiraled downhill from there. And so, uh, you know, you think, ah, oh, man, wonder what could have been done differently to, you know, to raise those sons. And I think sometimes we can get focused on something that is uh, even a godly thing, following God, and we can neglect our family. Okay? And I have said this myself, that if, if I win the whole world to Jesus and my kids go to hell, I'm a failure. You know, that, that's just my feelings, okay? Um, and then King David, he was a man after God's heart. He didn't do so well as a dad. 
But he still pleased God. He still pleased God. He still loved God. God loved him. Used him as a standard that he judged everybody by. But he still failed several times with his children. And he, he was kind of a, uh, a non-interactive dad. When the kids would act up, he just would kind of ignore it. He wouldn't say anything. A little bit like Eli did. But uh, he had a heart after God, which is what rescued him there. And, you know, sometimes I think we look at people that fail and we say, well, they blew it. They, God loved them and they blew it, so it's no big deal. It is a big deal. We don't use people's failures as an excuse to fail. We look at their, where people fail. The Bible, God didn't care, didn't bother God to list people's failures. It's Romans, what is it, Romans 5, 15, 4, says the things that were written beforehand were written for our learning. So we can look at these examples and look at what happened in life, and we can learn from them, and we can say, I'm not going to let that happen in my home. I'm going to make a dip. It's going to be different in my life, in my family. And so that's, that's what uh, I take away from that is to make a difference, okay? All right, now we're going to look at a couple uh, men of God who excelled uh, as fathers. And their children may not have been perfect, but how many knows children are individuals? Your children are individuals, and they got minds, and they have wills, they have free wills, and they do what they choose sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't please us. But I think the key is, when they, if they go astray, we pray they won't ever do that, but if they ever step off the path a little bit, will they return? And that, in my mind, is the key, because most of us have gone astray. We've done some bonehead things. Amen? And so our hope is... And our belief and faith in God is when you train him up, in Proverbs 22, train up a child in the, way his, in the way he should go. When he's old, he won't depart. Now, NIV, where are you at, Michelle? Oh, she was here a minute ago. Oh, she's in there. There she is. NIV, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling, rooting for you today. NIV says that in the way that, no, it says when he is older, when they are older. And that's what I have been saying for years. I don't want to just have a comfort in knowing that, you know, train them up in the way they go, and when they get 60 or 70, they'll come back, you know, if they fall away. I, I'm, not, I'm not good with that. I'm not good with that. I don't want to see our kids go one step off the, the straight and narrow. I want them to walk it the entire life. If they do, I want them, when they get older, maybe a couple weeks older, maybe a day older, whatever, they're going to come back. And they, when they're older, they won't depart. And I stand firm in that. I stood in that while we raised our children. I believe that for our grandchildren as well. Amen? All right. Now, here's something that's interesting. And this is from 1 Timothy chapter 3. And it's actually talking about... Uh, Paul was writing to Timothy about being a bishop. And so I took this very personal because, of, you know, the bishops kind of... the. It's used interchangeably sometimes as elders, bishops, overseers. It's similar to pastors. There's differences. But anyway, it's, if you just kind of generalize and say if you're called into ministry, if God, and, and, and I hate saying that because we're all called into ministry. We're all ministers. We're all able ministers of the New Testament. And so anyway, this applies to all of us, okay? That's what I'm trying to say, all right? It says, in, in the, I'm in First Timothy 3. Verses 4 through 5. Okay. It says, it's talking about qualifications for being an elder in the house. And it says that uh, you've got to be blameless, you got to, or a bishop, you've got to be husband of one wife, vigilant. But drop down to uh, verse 4. One that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man not know how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And I was like... Okay, baby, we're going to get out the scepter, I'm putting my crown on, and I'm going to rule this house. That's what it says, right? To rule your house. But you know, sometimes the translation of the original Hebrew or Greek into English, especially in King James, does, isn't as clear as it should be. And there's a word, I didn't, didn't care to write it down because it's kind of a long word and I wouldn't remember it, and I don't think most of us would anyway. But here's what it says. Now, guys, all of us, if you're a mom, if you're a dad, if you're a future mom, future dad, listen to what definitions of if, if you're going to serve God and you have children, this is what ruling your house well means. Ruling means 
to be over, like you're an overseer over them. You're watching over your family. One, it means you're watching. You're not, you're not, you haven't got your head turned. You're watching. It means to make firm. I mean, that's pretty cool. Instead of your kids being all running here and there and everywhere and they're not established, you make them firm. They're established. It means to watch over, to protect. I mean, that's pretty cool, to protect your children. Have you ever seen, we've had boyfriends come around. You know, we had three girls, and we knew we, they needed to be protected from certain ones, and we prayed and prayed and prayed until they exited. You know, the heat gets hot enough, they, they will leave, and that's what they did. Um, to care for and to give attention to. How many things that changes the whole meaning of what we normally think of as ruling? So I think that's a very, very cool uh, uh, thought of ruling well your house. You're caring for, you're providing for, you're watching over, you're protecting, you're guarding, you're keeping, you are uh, encouraging them, okay? Um, Now we're going to look at two people real quickly, and one is Job. Anybody remember him? Job, is he was one of the... He, in my mind, he makes the top, one of the top ten. I won't say which one because I don't know. Job had seven sons and three daughters. That's a lot of kids. And it doesn't say much about the kids other than he had seven and three. Okay, but God could declare Job blameless and upright. In verse 3, it said he was the greatest of all the men of the east. In verse 4, it talks about the days of feasting that that when the sons, his sons, had days of feasting on his day. That's the King James. And, and I thought, what is it that they, like, each take one day a week and feast it on that day? Or the NIV, here we go, NIV again, says it was their birthday. So if, if it was a birthday or their day of celebration, they would have everybody over and all the family get together and they would celebrate and they would uh, bring the sisters in and they would have a big party. And it said, verse 5, that Job sanctified them by offering burnt offerings early in the morning that, uh, because he said they may have sinned, they may have cursed God in their hearts, and Job did this continually. So in two things, Job, he provided for his family, and he watched over his family, he cared very much for their spiritual well-being. And he took action as a father to try to ensure that they were uh, right with God. Okay. Now, the last one is found in Luke 15. This is the story. Does anybody know what story that I'm going to be looking at today? Make any idea? Luke 15. Prodigal son. That's it. Prodigal son. All right. And we, I've spoken before about the prodigal son. I've spoken about the, the older brother. But today, I'm going to talk about the faithful father. And the faithful father, um, is he was a pretty cool guy. All right? And we're going to start in verse 12. And we know the story. The younger son rose up and said, Dad, I'm out of here. I want to go party. Give me my part of the inheritance. And it says, uh, he says that in verse 12. And the father gave unto him his, his living. And I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't get that. I don't get that. You know, he's like saying, Dad, I can't wait for you to die. So just give me your, the inheritance now. You know, I don't have, know how that works, but Dad went ahead and gave it to him. I don't get that. So there's some things in the Bible I just don't understand, but that's okay. But what I do get is that his father didn't, you know, his father didn't say, boy, you ain't going to go out there. If you go out there and live in that world, I'm going to disinherit you. You ain't getting nothing. You're not going to get a thing. Are you all with me? He didn't put ultimatums down on him. He didn't try to control him. How many know some, most of the time it does not work? You can try to control people. You can try to tell them it's either my way or it's the highway. You can try to say, you know, you can try to force them to, to do what's right. But how many of those, they've got to see it in their own eyes. They've got to, and I, I've told Bridget yesterday, I don't have to look at a dumpster back there, like that one in the back. I don't have to look up in there and say, ooh, that looks like trash. I believe I'll just jump in there, wall around and roll in it for a while and see if it really is. You know, some people are like that. They have to say, oh, that looks like fun. Let's go jump in. Dumpster diving, you know. And I, some people do it. They do that in life. And they do that. They can see people that are addicted to drugs, but yet they do it. I don't get it. But the thing is that he didn't try to restrain him or force him. And I thought, you know, 
How many of our Father God's just like that? If we choose to go out and sin and live in, live in all kinds of debauchery, he doesn't. He, I've heard it said this way, and I believe it's true. If we do it, we do it going around every roadblock that he sets up for us. And he will set roadblocks up. But he doesn't restrain us and hold us down, okay? All right? And we know that he uh, had his uh, riotous living with harlots and partying and drinking and everything. And then he ran out of everything. And when he ran out of money, his friends ran out too, right? Okay? And we spent all. There was a mighty famine. And it's in verse 14. And he, uh, in verse 15, he joined himself to a man who was a pig farmer. And so he, uh, he, he was starving. He was just totally beat down. And in verse 18, he finally came to himself and he said, I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Now, there has to be some kind of a, uh, an environment that he left that he knew, if I go back to dad, he's not going to beat me up. He's not going to beat me down. I know my father and I know that he's a good father. And I know that if I go back to him, I can find love and forgiveness. And almost every time that I've ever read this story, I come to tears because it just grips me, the, this, the love that this father has. So he had set an example of open arms and love, free-flowing love before the son left. And he knew that his father was not austere, that his father was not harsh, his father was not condemning, he knew that his father was nurturing, and he knew that he had a safe place to go back to with his father. He was going to humble himself, and he was going to say, you know, I've, I don't even deserve to be called your son. Remember, he rehearsed it. It says right here, he rehearsed what he was going to say. So he goes back, and in verse 20, it says, um, and he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, say that with me, great way off. Great way off. That's how far is a great way off? That's pretty far. Pert far. Pretty far. Pretty far. That means they looked kind of little. Like in the, in the on the horizon, they looked kind of little. And his father saw him. And that tells me that his father always had hope. His father always had hope. He never forsook hope. He believed that what he imparted into his son would eventually bring the son back. And he kept watching. Are you all hearing this this morning? He never lost hope. He was always watching. And, and this is the way I've seen it. You all have seen me do this. I can see him out there. You know, he's, he's harvesting the wheat. And he harvests some more wheat. Then he looks and he harvests some more, or he, throw, he pitches a few bales of hay, then he looks down the road. I could just see him before he goes to bed at night, he kind of takes a peek down the road. He's always watching. He's always watching for that son. Now, the, the word doesn't say that, but I, that's just me. He, when he was a great way off, and it says his heart, never, his heart never hardened against his son. Now, think about this. you got a son who you've taught them to honor Yahweh, to honor the King of kings and the Lord of lords, to honor God. And you've taught him to, to give and to sacrifice and to work hard and to be faithful. And this son rejected everything that was dear to you. Every belief system that you had, he says, I don't want any of it. I don't subscribe to that. I don't want any part of that. I'm going to go do my own thing. And this son even though he implied that by his actions, the dad didn't get hardened towards him. And you know, have you ever, has you ever said anything harsh against God? Has anybody ever said things harsh against God? Like, you're there for them, but you're not there for me. You left me when I was stranded. I heard somebody share this story not too long ago, and they, they've had some very difficult roads to walk as they grew up in life. And in their childhood, they had some things happen. And they, they said, God, why did, you, why did you not stop them from doing that that they did to me? 
this person told me this not very long ago. Why didn't you stop them from doing that to me? And God said, I did. But he doesn't physically hold us down and restrain us. And then, and then this person said that God spoke to them and said, you know, how many times have I tried to stop you from doing the things that you did? You didn't listen either. And this person had their eyes opened wide. They said, oh. Then they say, start remembering things that they did against his wishes or his, his conviction or his leading or friends speaking into your life. And they still, are you all hearing me this morning? But sometimes we do things and we've, we've all, I say we're all guilty. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the Father doesn't reject us when we have rejected him. The Bible says he cannot deny his own. He will not deny his own. We're his children. He will not deny us. He's watching, hoping for the return. And it says in verse 20, he ran to him. He had compassion on him. He threw his uh, arms around his neck, and he just hugged all over him. Verse 20, yeah, verse 20. He ran to him. He fell on his neck, and he's kissing all over him. And his son, he got more of a welcome than he had bargained for, more than he thought he would get. And, you know, back in that day, it was, uh, it was unbecoming. It really was. For, it was, for the, the elderly, the, the, the Jews in that day, if you were an elder, it was older, older, had children. He had uh, adult children. And it was unbecoming to be seen running. Running wasn't okay, but he's like, Heck with decorum. I'm going to get my boy. <laughs> and so he ran, chasing after his son. And he didn't care. He was more about, concerned about restoration than order, than, than what this thought is proper. Because he wanted restoration. He was more concerned about that. And too many times I think we think, well, this is right and proper. He needs to come to me. And he needs to bow down before me, and he needs to ask for my forgiveness. And the father didn't do that. He ran to him, and he was all about my son is home. Okay? And what a great father we have. I see Father God in this story, in and out, upside down. Every which way I look, I see the heart of Father God in this story. And, and it says, uh, let's keep on going here. Let's drop down to verse 28. We know that, well, and, and it says he put, the, the, he put the robe around him and put, gave him the signet ring. The signet ring, in case you don't know, is it's kind of like a, uh, the, the signature. It's like a signature ring, and it's like the family crest. And so when you, uh, somebody's wearing that ring, they're part of the family. And his dad puts the ring on his finger. He said, you're not an outcast. You're part of the family. Isn't <laughs> that awesome? He said, you're part of the family. I don't care where you've been living. I don't... John, Don Francisco used to sing a song, and it messed me up for years. I don't care where you've been sleeping. I don't care who's made your bed. And that was a beautiful song. He doesn't care about that. He just wants you home. He wants you to come back. He wants... It's not about being right. It's about relationship. And so he, he put the, ring, the robe on him and the ring on his finger. And, and then uh, verse 28 <clears throat> and then they have this big celebration. They kill the fatted calf, and they call all their friends together, and they're celebrating. And the brother was out, the older brother was out in the field, and he come home, and he's like, what's going on? He asked one of the servants that, verse 27, and the servant said, well, your, your brother that was, had left his home, and dad is celebrating. And the older brother got angry, and he wouldn't come in, verse 28. And his father, <laughs> in this beautiful story of the father, he had all of his guests there, and he had all these wonderful people there, and they came on short notice, and they were all celebrating with him, and it was a good party. And, you know, he didn't say, I can't leave my guests. You know, they sacrificed to come, and, man, I, you know, i, I got to entertain, and i got to be here for my guests. No. His kids took priority over everything, and he left the whole assembly of partiers and celebrators. He left even the son that just came home 
because he had a son that was hurting. And he went out to him. Now, can you see Jesus, if he was on the cross, if he was in heaven celebrating, and you were the only person on this earth, and you were dying in your sin, would he leave the whole celebration in heaven to come down here for you? I have no doubt that's the heartbeat of our Father God. And so he left everything, and he ran to his son, and he said, he said, son, what's going on? And he said that his son told him, Dad, I've been here, and I've worked hard, and I've labored, and I've slaved, and I've honored you, and I did this, and I did that. And I will tell you, teased about that. You wouldn't even give me a goat. Just wanted a goat. Just one goat. You didn't even give me a goat. <laughs> I think that is so hilarious. I just wanted a goat. You wouldn't even give me a goat, Dad. <laughs> and his, his father is, it says he entreated the son. Entreated in the King James. And that word entreated means he consoled him. He comforted him. And another definition is he strengthened him. And when you feel that you're lesser than the others, sometimes you can feel kind of defeated a little bit. You can feel like you're pressed down. But his father went to him and entreated him and comforted him and lifted him up. And he said, he said, son, everything, while you've been here, everything that I have is yours. I don't know about you, but man, in here and in here, that blows me. It just blows me up on the inside. He said, all that I have is yours. And so he was teaching him even while he was comforting in him. And his son didn't realize that. Think about God telling us, everything I have is yours. Can you see God, Father God, saying that to us? Everything I have. Do you need healing? Hey, I got it. It's yours. Do you need provision? Hey, I got it. Do you need restoration in a relationship? Hey, no, it's all easy. It's mine. I got it. What do you need? Do you need forgiveness? Hey, I am forgiveness. Do you need mercy? I am mercy. Can you see Father God? Can you see him in the father of this story? He said, everything I have is yours. And then he was teaching him. He said, it's right. it's, we're doing the right thing by celebrating because your brother who was lost is now found. He was dead, and now he's alive. We need to celebrate. And he's still in teaching the, the, the brother. And both the brother, both brothers, when that day is ended, both are restored. Both feel honored and lifted up and accepted and loved and cherished by their dad. That's a good day. That's a good day in the kingdom. Amen. Can you see Father God in this? So in definitely in the top ten of the good fathers is the prodigal son's dad. And it doesn't even list his name. It just says, yeah, it doesn't even say his name. That's so cool. But the ultimate father that we always, we want to be careful to give thanks for is Father God. We never want to leave any gathering together without honoring him. The greatest father is the, the, of all eternity, past and future, is Father God. <clears throat> and I love this statement. I've said it before. I posted it on Facebook. You know, when it goes on Facebook, it's, 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 it's the gospel truth. Everybody's like, oh, that's so good. The Son of God became a son of man so that the sons of man could become sons of God. What a great statement. What a great trade that is. And I just want to say uh, to all of our online friends today that <clears throat> the Father God that we serve, he is exactly like the prodigal son's father and then some. He's like the prodigal son's father on steroids. He is good. He is a good, good father. And we're going to pray a prayer, and I encourage anybody that's watching online today to pray this prayer with me. We're all going to pray it together. And I encourage you to just to pray this prayer with me. We're going to honor our Father God. Let's stand to our feet as we do this. <clears throat> He's such a good, good Father. Hallelujah. He's so wonderful. 
Now, one, one thing I did forget to say, and this feels kind of <clears throat> odd at this time to say it, but I, uh, the prodigal son, I never saw any place where he um, accused his son harshly. He, he never said, boy, you have any idea how many sleepless nights you caused me and your mama? He never said, you know, I told you and I told you, you wouldn't listen, you're a bonehead, you're a bonehead, you're a loser. He never said that to him. He never responded when the son said, you know, I've sinned in heaven, before heaven, I've sinned in your eyes. I don't even deserve to be called your son. The father never responded to that. He didn't respond to it at all. He just loved on him. What's the Bible say? Love shall cover a multitude of sin. That's exactly what happened. So, Father, let's just pray together. Father, I just, we just want to say, tell you that we love you. You truly are a good, good father. And we know that whenever we mess up, whenever we, as many times as we have messed up, you said that we're supposed to forgive 70 times seven times in one day. And if we have been commanded to do that, we know that your grace and forgiveness and mercy is much bigger than what we could mete out on this earth. And we know that you're forgiving. We know that you're gracious. And we call out to you, Lord, if we've spoken ill-advisedly against you, we ask you to forgive us today. If we have accused you of not being there for us, we ask you to forgive us. If we have charged you with even things that the enemy has uh, attacked us with, we ask you to forgive us and wash us. Lord, if we haven't been the father or the mother or the example to anybody that we should have been, we ask you to forgive us. And we come back to you right now just acknowledging that um, we're, we're not the perfect one. You are the perfect one. But you bring perfection, and you bring us to perfection and to maturity. And so, Father, we ask you to wash us today. And we just want to honor you and thank you that you are who you say you are and that you do what you say you'll do and that you are faithful to perform and to watch over your word to make it happen. And so, Father, we just declare today that we know that in you we have all that we need. We have all the provision. We have all the answers. We have the answers to the promises. We have the answers to the prophecies. We have answers to everything. And God, I just want to, on a personal note, I want to thank you, God, <clears throat> for the, <clears throat> the enemy had his sights on this woman. And he was intent on destroying her and everyone around her. But you... You were saying, not on my shift, not on my shift. And I'm thankful, God, that your love is so overwhelming. Your love is so wonderful, so gracious. And I want to thank you, God, that you not only brought her home to the Father's house, but you blessed her exceedingly with a miracle child that is just full of love. <laughs> we just give you praise, Father. We give you praise. Father, what you've did in Amber's life, you'll do it in every life of every loved one we have. We believe that, God. You're not, a, you're not a respecter of persons. You don't prefer this one above that one. So, Father, we want to thank you today for bringing our loved ones into the kingdom. We thank you, God, for meeting every need that we have. We thank you, God, that we can leave this house today knowing that you truly are a good, good Father. Now, I want to pray a prayer quickly for anybody that's watching on the online. And I'd like you to pray with me. And if you don't know that our God is Father God, then I ask you to just pray this prayer with me. It's a very simple prayer. It's an easy prayer. And like all the saints of God, to pray this prayer as well. Let's just pray together. Father God, we come to you together as children. And we know that we have messed up. We know that we have sinned. And we know that we need a Savior, and that Savior is you. We ask you to wash us. We ask you to cleanse us from all of our iniquity with the blood that flowed down on the cross on Calvary's mountain. We thank you that you have made us clean, that you've washed every one of our failures away, all of our sins, all of our disappointments, and we give you thanks right now because your arms are open wide 
and you receive us gladly into your family. And I give you praise and honor that I can be called your child today. And I call you a good, good father. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you're on, watching online and you prayed that prayer and you meant that prayer, then contact us. Uh, you can send us a message. I just ask you to contact us and just say, I prayed that prayer. I prayed that prayer today, and I meant it. So if you prayed that prayer, then, then uh, just let someone know. Uh, it tears the enemy up. It drives him crazy when people testify to the goodness and the love of God. So let's just make the Father's Day good and the day for the devil to be horrific. In Jesus' name, amen. I just encourage you all to have a fantastic day in the Lord today. Be blessed and everything. And dads, eat up big. You may not get a day like this till next year. <laughs> Celebrate. Don't kill the fatted calf, though. Let McDonald's do that. <laughs> Have a blessed day. <laughs> uh. <laughs>